people were not granted access to these new affordable loans. As a matter of fact, in 239 U.S. cities, the HOLC created color-coded residential security maps to decide where mortgages could or cannot be issued. The maps categorized neighborhoods by four grades, green, blue, yellow, and red. Green was for neighborhoods where professional men lived. These neighborhoods lacked, quote, a single foreigner or Negro. These were the easiest neighborhoods to get an FHA loan. Neighborhoods in red zones were considered hazardous because of infiltration by, quote, an undesirable population. These were predominantly black neighborhoods and were completely ineligible for FHA loans. Today, this practice is known as redlining. With virtually no other home ownership options, African Americans in cities were forced into neighborhoods that received little to no access to credit, mortgages, investment from banks, insurance companies, and savings and loans associations. Local banks considered these neighborhoods unfit for investment. Man, entire blocks were empty and crumbling. Access to healthcare, retail stores, and grocery stores with healthy foods was scarce. With limited businesses in the area, employment was rarely available, and crime in these neighborhoods often followed. If an African American in one of these red line zones wanted to buy instead of rent, remember, they wouldn't have access to the FHA loans their white counterparts did. So, in some places like one neighborhood in Chicago's west side, black people had to buy on contract. This was a predatory agreement where the buyer would often purchase the home at about twice the price that the seller had paid. The seller kept the deed until the house was fully purchased, in contrast to a normal mortgage where buyers can gain equity in the meantime. If the buyer missed just one payment, they would lose their down payment, all their previous monthly payments, and even the home itself the seller would get full rights to the home back and repeat the same predatory practice with another black buyer. On the other hand, white families were able to send their children to college using the equity they built. They were able to take care of their elderly parents and didn't need to depend on their own kids financially once they got old themselves. Most notably, they were able to build generational wealth for their families. None of these benefits accrued to African Americans. For decades, redlining was responsible for a widening disparity between a prosperous suburban America and impoverished inner cities. Finally, in 1968, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act, which made it illegal to discriminate in the sale or rental of housing in any neighborhood. It also made neighborhoods where FHA loans were accepted accessible to black people for the first time. But by then it was too late for many black families to afford the houses that had risen significantly in price over decades. Also, redlining policies were difficult to eliminate and have continued even in recent years. In 2010, the US Justice Department discovered Wells Fargo Bank had used similar policies to charge higher fees and rates to black and Latinx people. It also placed them in predatory subprime loans. A New York Times article exposed loan officers who called black clients, quote, mud people, and the risky subprime loans they pushed on them, quote, ghetto loans. In 2017, the home ownership rate of black families in the U.S. was 44%, compared to 73.7% for white families. According to the Brookings Institution, wealth is defined as total assets minus total liabilities. In 2017, black wealth in this country mounted to about 5% of white wealth, even though their income was about 60% of what whites made. The disparity in wealth is because, according to Forbes, equity from homes is the most consistent way to build wealth in this country. But without the same advantages, black people were boxed out of the best opportunity to gain generational wealth for almost half a century. African Americans have always had good reason to be skeptical of the American dream. Because for most, that's all it was, a dream.